On today's show, we continue to learn the design principles for residential HVAC contracting. Now, last week we dove into the design principles content, and today we're going to wrap up that conversation with Mr. Drew Cameron and EGI member Eric Kelsis. They're going to guide us through the entire content. Take it away, fellas. We're doing the technical survey of the house. Things as a company advisor, you have to go in and, and look for, and you have to diagnose what's going on with the, you know, the existing situation, and then put together possible remedies that you may have to address from a technical perspective so that when you quote the job and you hopefully sell the job and earn their business, that the scope of work is the right scope of work that's up to code, it's safe, it's gonna allow the machine to function the way that it should, it's gonna give your, your installers all the parts, pieces and materials as well as the labor time to be able to do the job. And so from a technical perspective, that's what we're, we're focusing in on is the system application. And so where we left off is you know, talking about oil to gas conversions in certain areas of the country. I know certain some things don't apply to certain people, but uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe not have uh, oil to gas conversions, but you have to, have to look at the refrigerant lines. Are you going to reuse the refrigerant lines? What are the sizes of the refrigerant lines? What type of refrigerant is that, is out there? And what type of a refrigerant is the new system going to be? And if you're going to reuse the lines, are you going to have to flush them if that's something that you do? And is that something that code allows? Is there insulation that's missing off the lines if you're going to reuse the lines? And you have to make sure that you're going to put insulation back onto the refrigerant lines that you're going to reuse. And if the lines are just snaked outside of the house, are you going to put a line setting enclosure on the ones that are there that you're inheriting and reusing or are you going to put a line set enclosure on the one and explain that to a homeowner obviously so that they can see that you're just not going to have that snake running down the side of the house here in addition to that condensate removal again the, you know, the way that they might be doing it may not be the best way to do it. In many cases, obviously, if you're using a condensate pan, you want to make sure that uh, you, you, pi uh, you pipe out the primary and the secondary so that the customer knows that there's a, 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 a stoppage on the primary drain. So you're piping out the secondary to a conspicuous place that they can see. That they know that they're seeing condensate come out and get the, at the secondary drain, that they got an issue. But you got safeties, triple, hopefully triple safety switches on the, on the pans as well. Uh, remember, we talked about yesterday, 90 percenters and humidifiers in the winter. How are you going to uh, drain those? out uh, so, so the, uh, the, uh, what you're expelling out is in freezing and then you got to make sure that you're basically hitting all the codes and clearances and I don't know what they all are for your area uh, but you know where are you exhausting the termination of, of your 90 percenter uh, you know and you have to be wary about windows proximity to ignition sources and, and uh, gas lines and gas valves outside as well uh, property lines and structures that you have to have clearance from, Dis condensate discharge location and what to avoid so that you're not dumping, you know, acidic water onto like a, a sidewalk or a patio. I've seen, uh, I've seen companies that had to buy whole new patios uh, or stamped concrete for people because they, they discharge condensate out onto the patio and it's acidic to some extent. Smoke and carbon monoxide detectors we talked about outside each bedroom or uh, you know, on each floor or even near the equipment to maybe be a safety thing. And again, it also differentiates yourself. The other thing you can also include uh, you know, that we did back at Cameron and Sons all the way back in the 90s is we also included fire extinguishers. You'd be shocked as to how many homes don't have, uh, number one, a fire extinguisher or a fire extinguisher on each floor. And that's something that you can include and mount as part of what it is that you do. Again, st separating and differentiating yourself. Uh, which we talk about in the uh, the sales training class as well. Uh, proximity to a dryer vent, uh, as far as you know, what you're exhausting uh, to. Uh, snow mounts, if uh, you guys, guys are in certain areas, do you want to put your heat pumps up on snow mounts um, and things of that nature? And so lastly, decks, overhangs, trees that are over outdoor units that might put droppings into the, uh, the outdoor unit as well as cottonwood. Uh, and so that's a variety of issues that we talked about, Eric, on a survey that we look for. Anything else um, on a survey that you look for? Inside the house, outside the house, behind the scenes? Kitchen exhaust okay. is a huge big one for indoor air quality. Yep, okay. Uh, attic fan, making sure that it gets covered in the winter time. What do you mean gets covered in the wintertime? Uh, attic fan is just like leaving a door open. Okay. So I like to put a cover on that in the are you, winter. are you talking about like meaning a, a, an attic? When you talk about an attic fan, you're talking about a whole house fan. Whole house fan. Whole house fan. Not, not the gable-mounted attic fan on, uh, on the gable or the roof-mounted. No. Fan. Yeah, okay. You're talking about a, one that's exhausting tied into the living space. Right. And right. again, I, would, I don't know why. Pe some people like those. They, they sound like helicopters to me. But um, <laughs> you know, again, I, no I agree. You know, if you're going to do it, you know, uh, put a insulated box that you sell over it, right? You can make it out of duckboard for the customer. Um, attic tents, do you do anything with attic tents? 
yeah, put them over the work. Yeah, they work very well. So attic tents are something, again, we don't have them here, but again, go search the term attic tent. Uh, there's a couple different uh, manufacturers of those out there. Uh, uh, those pull down stairs and those cubby holes, they leak incessantly. Again, we talked about the stack effect. Watch the videos on the stack effect from a technical perspective. Again, you're going to see why customers are uncomfortable. And again, you can be the person who provides the solutions for pennies on the dollar. Go ahead. It takes about 45 minutes to put an attic tent in and takes a little can of comp and some staples. Yep. And it's it's a way to sell another hour of labor. Yep. And, and really, it's to solve a problem. It's not to sell the hour of labor. It's to solve the problem. Again, you're the only one that's going to be talking about all this stuff, which is why we want the comfort advisors to do this. Otherwise, you can just be the box changer, and you're like everybody else. You're run of the mill, and customers will comparison shop you because you're comparison selling. And you're not compelling because you're not doing anything different, better, and more than anybody else. You all want something different, better, and more, but you got to be able to do something different, better, and more, be something different, better, and more, offer something different, better, and more. Then you'll be that value proposition will be worthwhile. And again, you will get jobs for three, four, five, six thousand dollars more than your competition uh, because it's the scope of work is completely different. And so our job is to diagnose the symptoms and the root causes of the issues that we're finding out there, develop a prescription of permanent solutions uh, versus temporary fixes and band-aids that you do, uh, you know, that may be short-term, uh, you know, short-term uh, fixes as, 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 as it were. And so you have to offer your customers all the options so that they can consider them. Like I said to you, I may offer things that they, I know they'll say no to, but that's the idea, right? Is let them see everything that's available to them and let them start to make choices. By eliminating certain things, they leave the subset of the things that they do value, that they are important. And when they look at those things, they now have perspective. Okay, well, yeah, at least I'm not spending $30,000, but I feel comfortable with this and I think this will address my concern. But if I just show them the one thing, they have no perspective of the other things that are available to them. And so what we make valuable we make affordable and economically perceivable by giving customers context of all the things that it is that they can do and like i said i gave you the survey documents um, in the the packet of information that you'll get here so let's talk about heat loss heat, heat loss heat gain load calculations because we measured the house we took all the measurements of all the rooms the windows the doors the insulation factors the number of people the appliances the direction that the house faces right all of that and we're going to plug it into either a form some calculation tool piece of software, an app, or something of that nature, right? Again, what are we talking about here, right? Houses lose heat and they gain heat, right? They lose heat during the winter and they gain heat during the summer. Insulation just slows it down. Insulation just slows down. Windows slow it down. Doors slow it down. We were talking about uh, yesterday here in the studio, there's a, a garage door uh, outside the studio that's in the... Uh, the, the, you know, the production area you know, behind the scenes here, and then there's glass block as well on the wall. And Eric made the comment, well, you tell me, what was the comment? Well, the glass has a lower R factor than the garage door does. Right, and you would think that the garage door would actually be more leaky as far as, well, it's more leaky. As far as, uh, but, more, uh, less resistance, if you will, than, right. than glass block. But the glass block here is extremely leaky. Right, and Allison Bales from Energy Vanguard says, a poor wall is still better than a good window. Right when it comes to resistance of basically letting uh, heat out or letting the, the solar gain in. And so this graphic kind of, I think, does a nice job of talking about what heat loss, heat gain is. Now you have to understand when we talk, when we talk about heat loss, heat gain, uh, I've been teaching this stuff for, geez, 30, 40 years almost, uh, you know, load calculations. And what you have to realize is, is what most contractors don't realize. There is what we call the design load. And that's obviously what you get from using your form or your software. But then there's the extreme load. That's the load that basically, if the temperature were to reach, let's say in Philadelphia, I'm sizing for 95 degrees. That doesn't mean on occasion we don't get to 98 or 100 or 102. That's the extreme load. But there's also what we call the part load, right? There's the days of the year where it's not 95 degrees. And, how, and understanding what that is, because like we talked about yesterday, what do we have available to us now, okay, that we didn't, you know, the homeowner didn't have available to them when the house was built? partial load equipment, right? And, and so again, it's like buying a two-stage air conditioner, two-stage furnace is like getting two, two systems in one, one for extreme days and one for the mild days. And like Eric talked about a little bit, I think it was yesterday, talked about we're going to probably be on first stage in heating and cooling in, in many markets, probably 70, 80, 85% of the time, of the 90 time. of the time, right? But see, if they have a single stage piece of equipment like they do now, it's all on or all off. They get all the capacity where they want it, need or not, every day of the year, regardless of the temperature or what's going on inside their house. 
But with a staged piece of equipment, they have a system for the mild days and they have the system for the extreme days. And it, the system automatically adapts and adjusts to what their needs are. And then if we go to a modulating system, again, it's 1% increments up and down and we float with the load. And so it adapts to what's going on outside, inside, and to your lifestyle. And the system, because of the communicating thermostats, it learns. And if you can't talk about this intelligently because you as a comfort advisor don't know about heating and cooling uh, load calculations, then you're going to go out there and a customer's going to buy you know, at the low end of the market. It's why the low end of the, uh, of the spectrum of equipment is the most popular equipment out there. Number one, a lot of that goes into the new construction stuff, but it's because most contractors race to the bottom, right? And, and it's competing at the, uh, the, at the lower end of the spectrum. I want my comfort advisors to be the most skilled people out there. They don't need to be able to do the work, but they need to be able to understand all of this. Right, so they can share, you know, and again, and then you're hearing me how we're taking it from the technical and taking it to a place where we can have a conversation with a homeowner and, and, and helping the homeowner understand what they're buying, right? Homeowners wanna understand what they're doing, right? It's a big problem and you can sell by doing a heat loss, heat gain calculation. You can sell multi-stage. Yep. You can sell variable speed equipment. It's so much easier. Yeah, uh, we have a gentleman uh, who's a member um, out in California. I saw him uh, a couple weeks ago in, in Nashville, and he's a user of our software, which we'll talk about here in a, in a little bit. And uh, he says, I, you know, I love doing a load calculation, and I love showing the customer, here's the load calculation and what you need for heating and air conditioning, okay, based on the design conditions for this market. Right. He goes, but he goes, more often than not, he asked the homeowner, more often than not, what kind of temperatures do you, do you, do you see during the winter and during the summer? And the customer told him that, and so he basically plug those two numbers into the software, software changed like that. And he says, now look what size heating and air conditioning system that you need. He goes, and guess what? Your system gives you everything all of those days. But he goes, I can get you a system that will match that, right? Don't and like he said, he does the heat loss, heat gain load calculations, adapts the temperatures, and he sells more staged and modulating equipment, sells actually zero single, uh, single stage equipment. Well, sometimes I'll see single if they've got a system up and a system down. Yep. So, uh, so what is the heat loss? Again, we're not going to teach these uh, these concepts in detail here, but I want you, you and your comfort advisor to understand what they are, right? In the heating season, the heat flows from the heated structure, right? Hot wants to go to cold, right? And so heat moves outdoors by way of conduction through walls, floors, roofs, windows, doors, and exposed ductwork, also by infiltration of cold air, and then it leaks out, exhalate, exhalation, right? So we have infiltration and exfiltration or exhalation of heated air through the cracks in the foundation and, and whatnot. And so the rate at which that happens increases the lower the temperature goes, right? So the lower the temperature goes, the faster the heat loss, fair? Yep. Okay, now we flip the script and we basically say, on the heat gain side, we gain, opposite. We gain heat the other way, right? And, and obviously the hotter it gets, the, the faster that the heat that's outside the house wants to come inside the house, right? Because it's lower pressure, lower temperatures inside the house, right? Right. And so the, the hotter it gets, the harder your air conditioner has to work. Most homeowners don't understand this. They just think they, you know, they go to the magic box on the wall, they dial up a number and they hope that they get a result. And they don't know how their system operates. This is where your job as a comfort advisor is, is to educate them. You know, I had, I had an army of salespeople at Cameron and Sons and then service experts when I worked there as well. And the connective the, was the utility that bought my company as well. Uh, I had an army of, of these people and have worked with armies around the country. And when comfort advisors can explain these concepts to homeowners, it's amazing when customers, customers just sit there and they just kind of lean in and they get, they get mesmerized. Right. Right. And then when you pull out the tools and you prove it, game changer, fair? You're the only one bidding. Yep. You're, I mean, you're the only, you're the only one they're going to even consider. Right. Right. Because you're the only one doing this. I think we all need a coach. I mean, I guess I look at Tiger Woods needs a coach for golf. And we surely need a coach for us around our business, help us around our business. When I talk to my coach, Bob, about different things, he's constantly giving me directions on where I need to go, do some studying, and get, you know, it's nice that it has all that stuff in the EGIA contract university, so. We've gotten a lot of really good advice. We're starting to implement some things that uh, we weren't doing. We're, we're unique because we only do ductless, so we have to kind of tweak the HVAC industry into our world, but we've been doing that and with uh, both Daryl's help and Bob's, we've been able to 
really rethink a few things and we're starting to make some big progress. The experience with Next Level Coaching so far has been really good. It's been really great to be able to talk about all things business and even the, the social or the, the difficulties that we're enduring, not just, it's not just KPIs, it's actually, you know, it's, it, it feels like it's human coaching more than business coaching sometimes. I would say the biggest thing that I learned is about pricing when I realized that I don't sell anything but labor. I control all my pricing through my kits and that's where my labor is built on. And so it's made me more competitive because I'm not, I'm not marking up big expensive items as much as I was, and yet I'm getting it all back from my labor. So it, it works, it works really well. I'm getting paid for what we install and getting paid for what we service. The biggest thing that we've learned from the Next Level Coaching would be the implementation process. So being encouraged on a regular basis to implement the things that we talk about and to be able to go back and either look at the numbers or to talk to you um, where you remind us of where we left off and to make sure that we're actually doing the things we said we were going to do. Somebody else has already done this and there are people who know how to do it. So go ask them and, and get the answers because it's already been invented. You're not going to reinvent the wheel. You just have to tweak it to your company and these guys have broad knowledge and and it just they, they they bring it in and they can make it work for you do it i mean next level coaching if i could convince everyone to be a part of it i think that's a big a, a big thing for us to all participate we need to participate in every avenue that's available to us through the EGA. You have no idea how many salespeople that I work with that we, we get them to basically, I, in fact, I do this, I did this in Nashville. We had 114 people at an EGIA event a few weeks ago, and I asked the room, how many of you do load calculations? I, I would tell you about 98, 99% of the room, hands went up. And I said, how many of you do load calculations on every house? And about 80% of the uh, hands in the room went down. And those are the people that I can knock out of the box every time with just the one thing that I'm doing. Because again, math, facts, science, data. You're, you're selling opinions, and my math, facts, science, and data will trump you, as well as my value proposition. And that's just one element, which we're going to talk about more about a little bit here. But what are some of the factors impacting the loads, right? It's local climate, weather conditions, and heating and cooling hours. It's the direction that the home faces. It's the design and the layout of the house, the number of stories. It's the square footage, the ceiling heights, the location, the number of appliances, and the lights. Again, we don't factor lights in except for about uh, two watts per square foot on a residential load. But if they got a lot of cam lights or halogen lights in their house, huge, right? They, they, they throw off a lot of heat, yeah. right? In a commercial load calculation, you actually have to factor in uh, each of the, the ballasts for the, for the load calculations, fair? We, we did a LED change out and we went from 27 tons to 14 tons. Okay. Uh, one commercial building. Right, number of people in the activity. Right. I mean, the amount of heat that we give off as people, it's about, uh, I think it's like 230 BTUs sensible and about 200 BTUs latent. Right. But if you basically go to a gym at a retail facility, that number jumps up into the 700 to 1000 range. Right. Because, again, you're you're putting off a lot of heat, and a lot yep. of pers perspiration. So, again, the activity uh, gets factored in there. The construction, what is the home made of the insulation factors and uh, is it drywall or plaster and what type of glass and tightness in the fireplaces because that's going to allow for leakage of, of inf um, materials, of information, excuse me, of uh, uh, whatnot. Um, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, home construction tightness, yeah. It allows for that infiltration and exfiltration, right? The home construction materials are the insulation factors, and what are the conditions of those, of those things, right? We, we talk about looking in an, uh, in an attic, right, and saying maybe they have R30 of insulation there, but if I look across it, and then it, go, it dips down to like three yes. inches, right? Again, what is the condition of the insulation? Is it relatively uniform? Use your best judgment uh, there. The duct system, like we talked about a little bit earlier, what is the configuration of the duct system? Where is it installed? Is it part of the living space? If it's part of the condition space, then I can uh, get rid of the duct loss and duct gain. If I'm going ductless mini splits, then I get rid of the duct loss and duct gain in that calculation when I'm doing my sizing there. What is the construction? And, and is it made of duckboard or uh, uh, is it flex and uh, and is it sealed uh, and or insulated, right? And again, tr transparency, full transparency. I have a co-owner of this software. Again, there's lots of tools out there, but we just got uh, plugged by Contractor Magazine. This is the article where they plugged us. But as a member, this is why I wanted to share this with you. You don't have to use our tool. Our tool is quick and easy. Eric's a 
is a user, this is a subscriber, it's $15 a month per user, but you get a, uh, or $150 a year, you get a 15% discount if you use that eds.tech forward slash EGIA. Uh, 14 day free trial, try it out, takes you about five to 10 minutes to do a load calculation. Yeah. You can do it right there on your phone, tablet, uh, yeah, tablet work. laptop, right, in the home. And again, you don't have to do it in the home. You could print this out after the fact or bring the laptop or the tablet back if you're doing a two-step process. So that's load calculations there. Once we do the load, Eric, we got, obviously got to pick the equipment. Now, what are the, some of the things we take into consideration you know, uh, when we're basically picking equipment? Ground flow, is it a rooftop unit? Is it horizontal? Yep. So, so the configuration, once you do the load, what type of thing are you replacing, right? We talked about what are the dimensions of that? Can you get it into where it's got to go, right? Might you need a crane? As you said, I was on a job last week where we needed a crane. Uh, I used to get a crane for half a day. Um, it was about $400 for half a day. You always have to get them for half a day. You know what this was last week? $1,600 for half a day. Wow. Unbelievable, right? The fuel, okay, uh, where, what is the fuel type that you have? Is it oil, gas, propane, right, or electric? The capacity, we know what the load is, right? And so what is the capacity? And from that, it's on the heating side, we size to the heat loss, right? And so with the calculation gave you a heat loss, right? And a heat gain. And a, gain, a heat gain. But on the heat loss side, we size, we basically have to pick equipment that gives us the output, right? Correct. Based on the load, right? So that's so the heat loss. So it's an 80% furnace, then you have to upsize the furnace a little bit. So this next thing I think is, a, in, my, in my travels over the years, this is, a, I think, a concept that's lost on many contractors. Sizing to, the, on the cooling side, sizing to the sensible gain. Yes, we have to cover the total load, but we size to the sensible load. Right. So talk about that a little bit. You've got latent, which is moisture, and is sensible. What's the larger part of the load? The total is sensible. And how much, like what percentage of the load is usually sensible, roughly speaking? I know it varies per house. but It, it totally varies per house, but usually uh, I, the latest uh, super high efficiencies, I'm only getting 10% latent removal. 10% late removal. So you're, you're saying the machine itself has a 90% sensible. sensible capacity? Yes. And what is the, the sensible load of the house, though, typically? What percentage of the load is the sensible load? Usually it's in the 90%. Yeah, usually that 80 to 90, 95%. You yeah. Know, yeah. And so, again, you have to size to cover the sensible load. What happens if we don't cover that sensible load, which is the majority of the load? What's the, what's the customer experience going to be? They're going to feel humid. Yeah, it's going to be. You you may have dropped the temperature, but you didn't remove the humidity. Extreme. And what's going to happen on the extreme low day that we talked about? Frequently, we have to add a dehumidifier, right, uh, with the air conditioner to get that extra moisture out. You might you have to add a dehumidifier, okay, or you may have to change out equipment. But the customer's experience, if you put in the wrong size piece of equipment, what's their experience going to be? If basically I'm sizing for 95. Mm -hmm and I didn't cover the sensible load. What's the customer going to experience? It's gonna be a hot night. It's gonna be a hot night, system's gonna run, it's never gonna shut off, and it's not gonna satisfy the thermostat. And what are you gonna do as a company? You're gonna be running service calls, aren't you? All day. Okay, no charge, zero dollar tickets, unprofitable, again, because your people didn't do heat loss, heat gain, load calculations, and size to the sensible gain. When you use the software, the software does it for you. It tells you exactly what you need to do. You don't have to rerun that calculation. Uh, in the packet of information I'm gonna give you as well, there are things that talk about oversizing and undersizing issues. Talk about that a little bit, right? Is it better to oversize equipment or undersize equipment? It's never better to do either, I get <laughs> right. it, but if you had to pick one. Well, I try to have the air conditioning to be 95% of what. So you're I saying undersize? Under, a May, little bit. If you were going, if you were going to be a anything, little bit. if you were borderline on the load calculation is to two to two and a half or three to three and a half ton. I'd go a little bit. You'd go lower. A little bit. Why? Because then that way you hit just about all parts of the year. Yeah. And think about it, you picked the extreme day in the load calculation software, right? That's the ex extreme load. How often did we get there? How many days of the year did we get there? And on those days, you're only pegging that load, right? It can be 30 hours, hours a year yeah. that you need that three-ton system yeah. and the rest of the time. So then you're right size 30 hours of the year and wrong size the rest of the year. Correct. Okay, and that's the idea. Better to be a little smaller because most load calculation software, FYI, by the way, especially ACCA Manual J, Hank Rakowski, the author of Manual J, has said 
most his software, the, the code that he wrote for that software oversizes by 20%. 28% sometimes. 28%, right? So it's again, a big number. And again, he's factoring in the fact that you said R19 installation in the attic. He knows in some spots it's R13 and R22 in other areas, right? So just kind of right. keep that in mind there. Uh, we also take into consideration airflow. Once we do the load calculation, the software also tells us how much air we need to move to move the BTUs, right? And so right. we then have to make sure we got the du adequate ductwork, right? Measure the ductwork. And so we talked about airflow in depth yesterday. And so make sure that you're your size, again, you went and measured the ductwork for the, you know, that's existing, you have to make sure it works for the new thing as well. Uh, installation location, where are you gonna be putting the equipment and is it safe, is it up to code, is it gonna be impinged upon by anything? Um, you know, the wet, new units are bigger than the old stuff. Will it fit, right? Yeah. Is there a bush in the way that has to maybe be removed? Uh, fencing that needs to be take, taken down. Uh, you know, to get it through, you know, through the fence. Are you going to need a super genie on a, on a job um, and whatnot? Are you be mounting a ductless mini split high on the sidewall? What's it going to take? Do I need a ladder, right? As a comfort advisor, that's your job to help be an extension of your installation team. The climate zone that you're located in, realizing, you know, in, in some cases, it doesn't make sense to go to the, you know, the top of the line on a 90% efficient furnace in Southern California. <laughs> I mean, if they want that technology, you know, so be it, but maybe, what we do is we get them to invest in a high-end air conditioner and in a uh, middle-of-the-road uh, you know, heating system. Again, whatever's going to fit their needs, but what climate zone are you, you getting tied into? Uh, I know, for example, in uh, Minnesota, uh, when I built their price book in Minnesota, uh, one of our EGI members uh, companies, uh, no, nine, no 80 percenters in the book. Mm -hmm. But you come down to the mid-Atlantic area, and we've got some 80s and 90s in the book. We've got heat pumps. You go up there, they didn't want any heat pumps in the book. They said, we just don't sell them. I said, I think that's a mistake, but I think they're changing their tune there. What is the technology that you're going to embrace to basically solve the customer's issues? And obviously, we talked about this on the IRA and the SEER thing, right? What, are the efficiency, what is the efficiency of the equipment? Are there any tax credits or rebates, utility rebates as well, manufacturer's rebates, uh, you know, for doing certain things? The promotions that are out there, the incentives that are out there, and I caution you know, comfort advisors, and the promotions that you put out there as a company, they're never the reason to do business with you, but they might be the reason to consider doing business at a certain level if the benefits of the machine are going to address the concerns that you have. Don't chase the incentives, right? Get the things that you want to get the result that you want, and then the incentives basically help. And so I teach you that, obviously, a little bit when we do the uh, elevated consumer buying experience class as well. And lastly, what are the benefits of the various types of pieces of equipment? So I want to kind of bring back what we talked about yesterday, Eric, into this mm -hmm. conversation. We talked about what is the technology that is available, right? There's two-stage equipment uh, on the heating side mm -hmm. and the cooling side, right, there, uh, as well as heat pumps. There's variable speed fans and X13 fans, mm -hmm. right? There's mod and, there, and there's modulating. What's that? Constant torque. Constant torque, right, the X13s. And then there's modulating furnaces as mm -hmm. well as heat pumps and air conditioners. So let's talk about, like, how does a customer benefit? We already talked a little bit about the two-stage, but uh, how does a customer benefit from some of this technology that's available? Well, the really super new technology does a better job getting a cold coil. Right. And then some of the stuff. Are there any takes. downsides to the, you know, the high-end technology that, you know? Yeah, some of it just doesn't dehumidify well enough. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I like the two-stage equipment better than some of the available speed equipment. Okay. Because it, it's a cold coil that takes the moisture out. What about some of this advanced technology uh, where basically shifting a customer from, let's say, a gas furnace or an oil furnace like we talked about last week in Virginia over to a heat pump or modulating equipment? They were used to this 140-degree air blasting out at them, right? And it's warm to the touch. And then they go over to this, like this woman in Virginia, right? She's spending $24,000 to get a uh, heat pump and new ductwork and, and all of that. It's only eight. The, the temperature rises only 20 degrees. So she's going to feel the, the right. air coming out is a little bit cool to the touch, right? Yeah. But will it satisfy the thermostat? Absolutely, if it's big enough. Okay. Absolutely. So as a comfort advisor, do you feel like you, you should be compelled to explain to the homeowner you're not going to Absolutely. get this, right? If they say they want it to heat yep. 8 degrees in the wintertime, 9 degrees in the wintertime, you're not going to put a heat pump in. Yeah. you got to you got to match what their needs are to what you can do right happiness is about expectations right and so you've got to manage expectations with your customers and notify them how this equipment 
any equipment that you're putting in, indoor air quality, HVAC uh, equipment um, and whatnot, changing fuels, all the things that you're doing, anything that you're doing that's going to change the comfort experience in the home, as a comfort advisor, it is incumbent upon you, you have a fiduciary responsibility to educate your homeowner as to how the comfort experience will change and evolve when you do these new things. We didn't realize this. Two-stage variable speed A's were coming on back in the, in the mid-90s back in my company. And I had a, a guy on my team, um, one of my best friends. He became one of my best friends, obviously, after working with me. But anyway, he sold a two-stage variable speed 80 to an elderly couple. And it was a great job. My, my team did a great job installing it. They were happy with our people. They were happy with our process. But you know what they weren't happy with? The comfort level. So we sent our people out there and we started chasing things and we re-ran the load calculation, making sure everything was right, everything was installed right, everything was performing properly. We got the manufacturer's rep out there to verify it. everything tested out, nine ways of Sunday properly. And you know what the, the basically Achilles heel to us was? That they, why they weren't comfortable? Even though we were matching the thermostat and it was comfortable, we put data loggers around the house and measured all the temperature. And you know what it was? They said, we're not comfortable. And we're like, why, why not? What's not making you comfortable? When our old system ran, guess what? We knew it was working the way that it should. We knew it was comfortable because it blew the curtains. And the new one didn't. Why? Because it had a variable speed fan that would ramp itself up. And again, it would hang at that mid-level, right? It didn't ramp itself all the way up to 100%. And it wasn't blowing the curtains at the same level. And in their mind, they weren't comfortable, even though all the data proved otherwise. And my salesperson didn't understand that because he didn't do the questionnaire that I, I provide to you and didn't do the analysis that we've been talking about here yesterday and today. Didn't talk about the various levels of technology. Didn't manage the expectations and changing things, right? Going from a, uh, an old temperature, uh, where it was an oil and gas conversion, by the way, and went from an uh, oil furnace that was putting out 140 degree air at the register to the 80% of it was probably putting out about 100, 125 degree air. So it was even cooler to the touch. And so we ended up having to uninstall that and put in a single stage piece of equipment, right? 100% money back guarantee for two years. That's what it is that you do. Awesome content right there, as always. Now, if you like this content, please share it with your friends on Facebook. And if you're not a member, go ahead and click the button below to get a free 30-day trial of our entire Contract University platform. We'll see you next week. Until then, my friends, bye-bye for now.